Chapter Eleven of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Eleven, In the Fog. But Smith, I began as my friend hurried me along the corridor. You are not going to leave the box unguarded. Nayland Smith tugged at my arm, and glancing at him, I saw him frowningly shake his head. Utterly mystified, I nevertheless understood that for some reason he desired me to preserve silence for the present. Accordingly, I said no more until the lift brought us down into the lobby and we had passed out from the new Louvre Hotel, crossed the busy thoroughfare, and entered the buffet of an establishment not far distant. My friend having ordered cocktails, "'And now perhaps you will explain to me the reason for your mysterious behaviour said I. Smith, placing my glass before me, glanced about him to right and left, and having satisfied himself that his words could not be overheard, "'Petrie,' he whispered, "'I believe we are spied upon at the new Louvre.' "'What?' "'There are spies of the Sifan, of Fu Manchu, amongst the hotel servants. We have good reason to believe that Dr. Fu Manchu at one time was actually in the building.' and we have been compelled to draw attention to the state of the electric fitting in our apartments, which enables anyone in the corridor above to spy upon us. Then why do you stay? For a very good reason, Petrie, and the same that prompts me to retain the Tulin Nur box in my own possession, rather than to deposit it in the strong room of my bank. I begin to understand. I trust you do, Petrie. It is fairly obvious. Probably the plan is a perilous one, but I hope by laying myself open to attack, to apprehend the enemy, perhaps to make an important capture. Setting down my glass, I stared in silence at Smith. I will anticipate your remark, he said, smiling dryly. I am aware that I am not entitled to expose you to these dangers. It is my duty, and I must perform it as best I can. You, as a volunteer, are perfectly entitled to withdraw. As I continued silently to stare at him, his expression changed. The grey eyes grew less steely, and presently, clapping his hand upon my shoulder in his impulsive way, Petrie, he cried, you know I had no intention of hurting your feelings, but in the circumstances it was impossible for me to say less. You have said enough, Smith, I replied shortly. I beg of you to say no more. He gripped my shoulder hard, then plunged his hand into his pocket, and pulled out the blackened pipe. We see it through together, then. God knows whither it will lead us. In the first place— I interrupted. Since you have left the chest unguarded, I locked the door. What is a mere lock where Fu Manchu is concerned? Nayland Smith laughed almost gaily. Really, Petrie, he cried, sometimes I cannot believe that you mean me to take you seriously. Inspector Weymouth has engaged the room immediately facing our door, and no one can enter or leave the suite unseen by him. Inspector Weymouth? Oh, for once he has stooped to a disguise, spectacles and a muffler which covers his face right up to the tip of his nose. Add to this a prodigious overcoat and an asthmatic cough, and you have a picture of Mr. Jonathan Martin, the occupant of room 239. I could not repress a smile upon hearing this description. Number 239, continued Smith, contains two beds, and Mr. Martin's friend will be joining him there this evening. Meeting my friend's questioning glance, I nodded comprehendingly. "'Then what part do I play?' "'Ostensibly, we both leave town this evening,' he explained, "'and I have a scheme whereby you will be enabled to remain behind. "'We shall thus have one watcher inside and two out.' "'It seems almost absurd,' I said incredulously, "'to expect any member of the Yellow Group "'to attempt anything in a huge hotel like the New Louvre, "'here in the heart of London.' Nayland Smith, having lighted his pipe, stretched his arms and stared me straight in the face. "'Has Fu Manchu never attempted outrage, murder, in the heart of London before?' he snapped. The words were sufficient. Remembering black episodes in the past, one at least of them had occurred not a thousand yards from the very spot upon which we now stood. I knew that I had spoken folly. Certain arrangements were made then, including a visit to Scotland Yard and a plan, though it sounds anomalous, at once elaborate and simple, was put into execution in the dusk of the evening. London remained in the grip of fog, and when we passed along the corridor communicating with our apartments, faint streaks of yellow vapour showed in the light of the lamp suspended at the further end. I knew that Nayland Smith suspected the presence of some spying contrivance in our rooms, although I was unable to conjecture how this could have been managed without the connivance of the management. 
in pursuance of his idea however he extinguished the lights a moment before we actually quitted the suite just within the door he helped me to remove the somewhat conspicuous check travelling coat which i wore with this upon his arm he opened the door and stepped out into the corridor as the door slammed upon his exit i heard him cry come along petrie we've barely five minutes to catch our train detective carter of new scotland yard had joined him at the threshold and muffled up in the grey travelling coat was now hurrying the smith along the corridor and out of the hotel carter in build and features was not unlike me and i did not doubt that any one who might be spying upon our movements would be deceived by this device in the darkness of the apartment i stood listening to the retreating footsteps in the corridor a sense of loneliness and danger assailed me i knew that inspector weymouth was watching and listening from the room immediately opposite that he held smith's key that i could summon him to my assistance if necessary in a matter of seconds yet contemplating the vigil that lay before me in silence and darkness i cannot pretend that my frame of mind was buoyant i could not smoke i must make no sound as prearranged i cautiously removed my boots and as cautiously tiptoed across the carpet and seated myself in an armchair i determined there to wait the arrival of mr jonathan martin's friend which i knew could not now be long delayed the clocks were striking eleven when he arrived and in the perfect stillness of that upper corridor i heard the bustle which heralded his approach heard the rap upon the door opposite followed by a muffled come in from weymouth then as the door was opened i heard the sound of a wheezy cough a strange cracked voice which nevertheless i recognized for smith's cried hello martin cough no better upon that the door was closed again and as the retreating footsteps of the servant died away complete silence that peculiar silence which comes with fog descended once more upon the upper part of the new louvre hotel End of chapter eleven